It's North Carolina's mid-October tradition, the State Fair. Come along next. Quality public television is made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting UNC-TV. I'm your host, Kelly McCullen, the eyes behind the camera, Nick Fuchs, for this special look at the North Carolina State Fair. Its mission has been to promote agriculture. If you're a fair goer, you might have a different mission, eating. Step up to the sugar shack. Everywhere you'll walk, you'll smell burning charcoal, and if you listen closely enough, you can hear the grease sizzle. Behind the smoke and grease are vendors who are launching new food items every year. Snickers up. Some of these items grab media attention, like this deep fried concoction. It's a Twix bar stuffed inside of a Twinkie wrapped in bacon and then if that wasn't enough we deep fry it for you. All right. Did you get that? A deep fried bacon wrapped candy bar stuffed Twinkie that's dipped in batter. Paul Amburn and the crew from Murphy House invented that dessert. Maybe configured is a better term. Every year we come up with a new item and we look around and our research and development department works real hard and this year they came up with this one. The research and development pays off, and fair goers, you will at least try this when there's no question you would think twice about it any other time of the year. It's for people who are looking for something extra, something more adventurous, and what more, I mean, what better place to find adventure than the state fair, right? The Murphy House tent deep fries almost anything and practically everything it offers at the state fair. There's more batter here than at a Waffle House. You throw in some eggs, you'd have breakfast. The Twix is already inside wrapped in the middle, so then we uh, take our bacon and we wrap our bacon around it. You want to make sure that it's firm, so you just kind of squeeze it in there a little bit. We're going to drop it in our batter. I'll drop it up here for you guys. Make sure it gets coated in batter. Corn dog. Corn dog in the way. Thank you, you, sir. Pull it out of the batter. Yeah. And you drop it in the fryer. Hey, love these turkey legs. Across the fairway, you'll find the smoke and those giant turkey legs you can't find anywhere else. Oh, you don't want my leg, but you want one of these turkey legs. Come on now, gobble, 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 gobble. Maybe they grow those giant turkeys in Memphis, Tennessee. That's where turkey leg grill master Donnie Brown lives. Where well, the secret is, is where you cook it. You got to know how to turn it and keep it turning. And make sure it's just like this, soft and juicy. McBride's turkey legs give you nearly two pounds of smoked goodness. You can take one of these here and walk around the felt all day long and eat it. And then you still don't eat it all. You can take it home and still eat it. Like a caveman walking around with a big bone like that and meat on yeah. a dinosaur leg. Well, you know what they, that's what they did in the day. So it's the same thing. Down the way, they're serving giant frog legs at the Raging Cajun. I'm told they taste a bit like chicken, maybe a bit like fried fish. We do a lot of hunting and stuff, so I mean, it's, it's pretty cool. Uh, they're not scared to try much. She's eating a little gator, a little gator there. And she said it tastes just like chicken. So. The Raging Cajun booth is offering fried bananas foster. It's the invention of Chris Wren, a caterer who runs the tent and normally offers more fine dining options. But at the fair, Chris believes finer dining needs a twist. People want something they can walk with. They like something unique. And, uh, and we enjoy that. It's a nice change of pace for us. Chris is frying his frog legs, alligator, and bananas foster, but he says that's as far as he'll take the gimmick. We go with the crawfish tails, the shrimp, uh, the gator, the frog legs. A lot of what we serve is uh, pretty expensive uh, for us as far as food cost, and uh, I think that's probably where it's going. I really do. There are endless food options at the state fair, and most of us only have so much stomach to fill and only so much wallet we can empty. Whatever you decide to do, at least arrive in Raleigh hungry and feeling adventurous. A few fair vendors can say they've been here several decades, but only one has earned a century of distinguished service here on the fairgrounds. It's this restaurant. It's run by two Cary Methodist churches, and they've served one staple item that's kept the crowds coming since World War I. There's a lot of history behind the sizzle of that country ham. We're in the kitchen of the Cary United Methodist Church State Fair restaurant. One ice water. It serves State Fair patrons every year there's been a fair since before World War I. 
This booth has been the longest running concession run by the same organization uh, at the fair. So I mean, this has really been a real tradition and people really step up and, and try and keep that tradition going. The booth requires nearly 100 volunteer church workers every day to serve the huge state fair crowds. We've been here the longest, over almost 100 years, maybe 100 years, and we make the best food and people know us by our reputation and by our friendliness and by the fact we praise God. Thank you. They come here year after year and they know that it's good quality stuff and it's for a good cause. Cary's First United Methodist Church and White Plains United Methodist Church supply the volunteers for the fair's annual 10-day run. The marquee dish is known far and wide. It's the country ham biscuit, and, and the reason it's so popular is because those ladies back there, they know how to make biscuit. Get our ham cookers that have been cooking ham for years. They have to apprentice in order to get to this position, and so people vie for the positions of making the biscuits. The most coveted kitchen jobs are the biscuit makers, but with that great power comes even greater responsibility, getting up earlier than everyone else. Fred Kastner is the morning's biscuit stuffer. Biscuit makers and the biscuit stuffers come in earlier so we can uh, be ready to serve the customers when they get here at 8 o'clock. Are any of you professionals? professional at other stuff, but not at cooking, that's for sure. But we get we get really professional very short period of time. About five minutes, we're professional. It's a completely volunteer, non-profit effort to cook all those breakfasts, lunches, and dinners. It's a staple for a lot of folks who come to the fair every year. And of course, as Methodists, uh, we're known for being able to serve food. This operation does pay dividends, so to speak. When customers buy a biscuit from your breakfast, what is it helping out in the greater world? Our missions, the mission projects of both churches are benefited by the booth. For the record, the Cary United Methodist Church restaurant is not the only place serving and claiming to serve the state fair's very best ham biscuit. But for the record, no one else has a track record as long as the Cary United Methodist Church restaurant. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner are covered. It's dessert time. A lot of choices out here, but consider the North Carolina State University booth. They have their own homemade ice cream you can't find anywhere but the fair, and people wait in line. This one, in fact, a long time for one scoop. North Carolina State University's ice cream booth is as popular a state fair attraction as anything. Wolf Cup! We calculated there, there was a cup or cone served every 12 seconds from the beginning to the end of the state fair. The ice cream is produced by the Howling Cow Creamery at the heart of North Carolina State's campus. It's somewhat a rare ice cream in that it's only served on campus and available publicly at the ice cream booth during the fair. It's a significant percentage of the ice cream we make every year. We actually start in mid to late June to stockpile enough ice cream by the October State Fair. The Howling Cow's big walk-in freezers are overly stuffed ahead of the state fair. Gallon tubs from floor to ceiling, there's only enough freezer space for the cold air to flow. We typically have one big freezer, but this time of year we've got two other freezers in the building full of NC State Fair ice cream. Crunch cup one, got it. Crunch cup two to the back. And state fair goers will practically wipe out the fall inventory. Vanilla, chocolate, strawberry, your standard flavors. We have the Chancellor's Choice, which is Wolf Tracks. We have Campfire Delight. That's a long flavor menu to match those long state fair lines. Raspberry flavors, Robert's Raspberry, um, some other kind of berry flavors. I've got a Crunch Cup. And then I've got a cookies and cream shake. Yep. We are from the NC State Food Science Club, which is super awesome. And this is our big fundraiser every year. Chocolate milkshake. Got it. Thousands of gallons of ice cream are served to state fair customers who sometimes wait up to 30 minutes for a single serving. I hear the lines here get very, very long as the fair goes along. Just, just a little bit. What's a little bit? A uh, little bit would be wrapped all the way around our gates and out across the front. and. Um, Sometimes, you know, it's hard to see the light at the end of the tunnel. And I kind of incognito, usually I'll go toward the end of the line, find people eating ice cream, and I always ask them, was it worth the wait? And nonstop, they always say yes. So let's do that in a shake. Peanut butter shake. Got it. Every scoop sold helps our next generation of NC State trained food scientists. It helps with um, 
different scholarships and to people who need help with parking permits and just general needs with the food science department. And it's wonderful. Anybody that participates gets what they work back. But the ice cream booth is as much fun for the students as it's a dessert destination for us fairgoers. So if you've got five bucks in your pocket and a few calories to spare, you can do some good by ordering a cone of ice cream. Outdoors, the pros dominate the fair food offerings, but in this building, the amateur chefs are making their mark on a taste-by-taste -taste basis. The vendors along the fairway know we like our fair food deep fried and on sticks. Oh, but the judges of the daily cooking contest seek a different style of culinary creativity. We do a contest every day. So it's 11 contests. Every contest has a different theme. Some contests actually say 10 ingredients or less. This morning, grits are the star attraction. Some dishes look elaborate, but Andrew's Rebecca Gano stay with tradition. I just did cheesy grits. That's simple, and I understand what that recipe is. <laughs> Man, a lot of people like it. In fact, one gentleman I work with said, you have got to go put your grits in to the state fair. Amanda Bory fell in love with Southern style grits after moving down south from up north. Her dish this morning sounds like a fancy dinner. Several layers, you know, a flavor there. You've got the smoky chipotle hollandaise. Um, also, you've got the beef brisket, uh, but then the creamy grit cakes with some Parmesan and herbs, so. Is that something you just make every day at home? No. Apex contestant Gail Braley's grits casserole is huge on flavor. It's worth blowing your diet. It has grits, it has um, taco seasoning, then it has beans, refried beans, and then it has cheese and nacho flavored chips with sour cream on top and I'm going to put olives for decorations. You've made that before. Well, it is good, I'll have to tell you that. Others believe grits can win championships if made into a dessert. How about chocolate grits with cherries on top? That's what Raleigh's Felice Bogus made. I like doing different things and um, I figured well, what's the least likely thing somebody's going to do with grits? Make chocolate pudding. The cherry is really the cherry on top. There you go, absolutely. Durham resident Silka Bourgeois brought in grits cheesecake. I made it last night, I let it cool, and I cut it up this morning, and I had this for breakfast. <laughs> Many recipes will end up in an official cookbook with the ribbons looking really nice on a chef's kitchen wall. This is a contest that welcomes anyone in North Carolina willing to get up early, cook a dish, but let the fair decide its fate. There's more food at the fair than we could possibly eat. All the bases are covered, so let's turn our attention to drinks, especially North Carolina's booming beer and wine industry. A long-standing rule makes alcoholic drinks a big no-no during the North Carolina State Fair, at least on the fairground. It's called a session beer. But microbrewers and winemakers are making such an economic statement for North Carolina, the industry demands state fair attention. Last count is $1.3 billion per year in, uh, industry for just wine and beer is uh, on our coattails. There's over 150 wineries in North Carolina, 125 breweries. It's big business. The businesses won't market on the fairgrounds, but they will meet fairgoers attending the Hunt Horse Complex, many of whom can taste samples of the wine in North Carolina beers, plus sample the horse shows that provide an entertaining break. We love this show, this venue. We, this is our second year here. We love this venue. Being in the, uh, um, the, having the horse show here is great. It's a lot of fun. And I'm really glad the breweries are here this year also. The rules apply at the fair as everywhere else. You better be 21 years old to taste the wine or beer products, but be any age to enter and enjoy the horse complex. We can't sell anything they can drink here on the property, but they certainly can purchase and take it home and enjoy it. From North Carolina grown muscadines to the brew pots of in-state breweries, beer and wine makers are making their mark. This row of vendors reflects some of the best. We're looking for uh, businesses that kind of epitomize North Carolina. They're using North Carolina fruit in their products, uh, North Carolina beers that are kind of made here by North Carolinians. Um, so just kind of what people would expect from a North Carolina product. There's a creative partnership between North Carolina's beer and wine makers and the legacy horse shows here at the North Carolina State Fair. Both are keeping the Hunt Horse Complex very active during the fair's run, as well as keeping the horses relevant to the State Fair experience. 
The horse shows at the North Carolina State Fair are facing some big challenges. For the last three or four years, the, the Hunt Horse Complex, the horses have been absent. The breeds are just not showing up. State Fair Week places the fair's horse shows against national and international world conferences in the horse world. That means many trainers head out of state, but the North Carolina Horse Council stays at home. It's thinking outside the box on ways to reinvigorate the horse shows. What we're going to do is get the local people, the kids that have come out and own their backyard horse, Come out and show with us. Come out to the horse show. The Horse Council is offering free five-minute horse riding lessons at the Hunt Horse Complex during parts of the state fair. It's a hidden gem. The kids have really looked forward to it. They've enjoyed it. They've been smiling. They have just been skipping away. The riding lessons are one ride that doesn't cost any tickets, just a brief walk across the street from the fairgrounds and a willingness to learn about horses from the very people who love them best. The kids, some have just wanted to pet. We've even had adults that have ridden and adults that just want to have talked about maybe they'd just like to have one in their backyard to take care of. The horse shows are free of charge, as are the riding lessons when you can catch them being offered. These are all volunteers just hoping to keep the Hunt Horse Complex thriving during the North Carolina State Fair. Here on the other side of the fairgrounds, livestock is more popular than ever. It's also proving more lucrative than ever for students who sell their animals here at the fairgrounds to raise money for scholarships. The state fair is full of so many traditions, but this Saturday evening auction is the next one. Hundreds of onlookers are watching dozens of these deep-pocketed bidders buy the fair's championship livestock. A portion of every sale benefits educational scholarships. Carly Pierce sees a student who won one. We've been coming to the State Fair four years now, so it's a really big deal. I um, love the friendships I make, and I just really love spending time with my heifers. The Junior Livestock Sale of Champions has historically been a rather low-profile event, <laughs> but bringing it from a back room to the main exhibition floor changes the dynamics and the dollars involved. You got a good crowd here tonight. An excellent crowd. Very exciting time. I got good folks to help cover the crowd. We look like we're going to have a lot of activity, so it's exciting. Randleman High School senior Sophie Farlow raised and now must say goodbye to her grand champion turkey. What goes into this? Um, a lot of hard work and time and a lot of food. I've sold it for 9500 and goes to Tally Farms. With an auction value of nearly $10,000, this is likely the most expensive turkey you'll see. How did you know she was a champion or a champion in waiting? Uh, from the moment I got her, I kind of knew that she was bigger than last year's. Sophie's high school career is winding down, but Zade Jennings is on tap to fill her footsteps. His dad, Brent, is his coach. You look a bit nervous watching him out there trying well, to handle Well, I can him. tell you I am. I'm a proud dad. So. How's Zade doing for his first show? Oh, he had a great time. We just uh, It was a success by just, him just having fun, so that's all we could ask for. The little guy is wrangling a $10,000 goat. Maggie Williams and her 4-H friends from Farmville, North Carolina, earned top dollar by selling Gale their land. We go to a lot of circuit shows during the year, and he's placed very well in the circuit shows. So we had a feeling that it would be at the top of his class, but we weren't sure about the champion or anything. The secret to raising a champion seems to be good food, clean water, and lots of exercise. It takes a lot of work energy. Um, we all have to work them every day of the week. And we have a hill, and we walk them up and down the hill. The sales prices might seem staggering, but the scholarships are valuable, both to the students who earn them and to the companies who buy the livestock to boost the scholarship fund. We're here to showcase agriculture in North Carolina, especially our young 4-H youth here all across the state tonight. Tom McKinnis' Iron Horse Auction Company handles the night's online bidding. <laughs> we got them uh, potentially bidding from all over the world. They're signed up, of course, on the internet, which is worldwide. So we've got people who are interested in agriculture, interested in, in livestock here in North Carolina, and of course, uh, they're, they're interested in 4-H kids. The livestock auction is fast-paced and it's exciting. One time! All by design. A lot of times the actual bidder doesn't know where the money is or how much it is. So we kind of coax him along. 
And if we think he needs to spend a little more, we try to coax him even more. You're in the lead over at Bruce side at 10,000. A lot of times people think, well, I wish I had a, after it's over, we try to get them to do it while they're doing it. So if you're a bidder at a big time auction where prices can get up, you can second guess yourself right out of either a good deal or something you wish you'd have bought in the first place. That's exactly right. The buyers did not miss their opportunity at this marquee auction. The sales earned these kids a share of nearly $168,000 in proceeds, the highest total in North Carolina State Fair history. It takes a lot of energy to come to the fair and spend all day. So if you need a time out, come here to the Garden and Flower Show. It's quiet, there are a lot of seats, and you can see the results of some really hard work from some serious green thumbs here in our state. Ask most people about the state fair and you'll hear about the food and the rides. But what someone should tell you is to visit the flower and garden exhibits. A huge amount of work goes into building each small landscape. It just looks like it's always been here. I can't tell you how many people I do talk to and they say, there's gardens out at the fair? David Spain works alone. You guys are going to be working with Mr. Wood on setting up all the lights. We have more lights right here. Schools like Raleigh's in Low High will bring 18 volunteers to build a garden. I like dirtiness. I like, you know, fresh air, the earth. It's, it's wonderful for me. Oh, that's for the most part. First time we were here, oh my gosh, digging holes. There was just a whole bunch of rocks, like, everywhere down here and I'm just like who does this? That would be groups like Enlo High School's club the food arm. That's Divine Young and she's a member. It could also be the team from South Johnson High School where horticulture students are hoping to win the fair's prize to fund their FFA chapter. The cryptum area is going to be coming in between. The gold dust is just going to be kind of scattered behind there and I'm going to leave that fat tier there just for size. Okay. Cindy Adams is South Johnston High's horticulture teacher. We're going to be working on um, trying to just implement all kinds of fall color for this year. Anything that takes the sun, we're using the drift roses, we've got the muley grass. Uh, barberry is a definite winner with color for foliage. But this really isn't about the money or any ribbons. It's about life, growing up, and proving that creative school teachers make a difference. Jonathan Hardy studies under South Johnston horticulture teacher Cindy Adams and he gives her credit. She's learned me a lot of things. She's a really good teacher, and she's helped me gain a lot of leadership. South Johnston freshman Heather Ennis has the faith in face of her first high school competition. I think we can do it. I got confidence in us. I mean, it's just good because it's a lot of work experience and hands-on experience for everybody. Uh, even a model of it. When they come to the State Fair, they don't even know a garden exists. And now all of a sudden they're out here and they're having a great time and they're putting plants in the ground and I think they really enjoy it. Being in this group of people who, they're all like great and um, just volunteering and getting to learn about all this stuff, it's really rewarding. Put it in the corner as far as it'll go. While the high schoolers work, David Spain is working alone. He's not competing, he's an exhibitor. He's a big fan of using moss. And there's another five dollars. <laughs> this is awesome, man. Well, it's going to be mossum. Yeah. <laughs> Using spray foam and his imagination, David thinks a moss-covered lion will make you a fan. First and foremost, it's education for me. It's to get the word out to the public that moss is a great landscaping plant. The fair's flower show and garden exhibit should not be a secret, but it might be a bit hidden. And it's certainly a bit of a sanctuary if you need a moment away from the state fair hubbub. We can focus on the food, but you can't forget the rides here at the North Carolina State Fair, a prime source of fun for kids of all ages. It's also a top focus of state safety inspectors who let us tag along with them as they inspected a ride. A huge part of the state fair is the rides, and every fair ride, as well as those at your local carnival, receive the attention of the North Carolina Department of Labor's inspection team. So you can get a mat, a big mat to cover up that hole. Be good to the inspector team approves every ride from the state fair amusements to your office elevator. We inspected last year close to 7,000 amusement rides and about 24,000 elevators and about 50 some tramway devices. That one looks pretty good right there. Check keys over here. And if you could, Paul, grab some, uh, go ahead and take Looking that tape good. off. 
and let's take a look at it and then we'll retape it to see what you got to make sure your butt splices look good on there. Right inspection rules are clear cut. They're also non-negotiable. The inspection rules never change. We inspect to 100% manufacturer specifications. So that makes it easy for us. Manufacturer requires, we require it. You see this latch here, when you pull it open, when you come down, put it in there, that thing should automatically go in. So you shouldn't have to hit it to make it go in. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna get him to look at this. He's gonna take a little bit off of that so that when this thing goes in, it automatically goes in. So it, cut, it cuts away from any operator error. Inspector Casey Kirkman works with right operators who know the drill. Make sure your protective cover here over your brake is intact and together on both sides so that none of the hair or any objects get in there on the brake. These rides travel from town to town, from fair to fair, and that increases maintenance and wear and tear. Casey can point out what's working, but takes note on what he'll be re-inspecting after repairs are made. Well, if you could, just kind of wrap it up nice and neat and put your wire tie on it to keep it from falling out. All right. It's only after state inspectors ensure that a ride is structurally safe that any rider can climb on board. Then it's up to ride operators to act responsibly in the safe operating of their amusement. And riders and parents, you should follow heightened safety rules. They try to slip somebody that's not tall enough to ride a ride by standing on their tiptoes trying to fool the ride operator. Or they get in and they don't get the restraint down as tight as they should because they want to be able to move or something. At the fair, you might see an inspector walking around, but rest assured they'll keep a low profile. Their job is to keep you safe and keep the rides running. Well, we're here to have fun after all. That's the show. See you at the fair. Quality public television is made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting UNC-TV.